As children growing up in Fiji, we were left to largely entertain ourselves, and I would inevitably find myself drawn to the seashore. Some of my earliest and fondest memories are actually of my Auntie Tether, featured in this photo here, taking me to her village on the island of Motoriki in the Lomai Viti group. There, I would spend my time following the older women around in the village, watching them as they went out onto the reef flats to glean for sea urchins, for sea cucumbers, and for nama, a type of edible seaweed. I would follow them into the mangroves and watch in absolute awe as these women would wrestle mud crabs with their bare hands. I also have a very vivid memory of my Auntie Tether making me sort of crawl up through these river rapids to find these quiet pools behind. There, she very slowly and carefully made me lift up these, these sort of grass reeds growing along the edge of the river to find a myriad of very small shrimp hidden within. And she explained to me how her aunts had taught her how to catch those shrimps, and she in turn was passing on that knowledge to me. You have to remember this is a time in the 1980s when marine biology of any sort was not taught at school. So everything that we learned about our oceans actually came from our elders around us and whatever they were willing to share with us. And I found myself this sponge, just hungry for knowledge about the marine life on our doorstep and in my playing ground. As an adult, I started working on coastal fisheries and I started to spend a lot of time in rural villages in Fiji. And I sort of realized very early on in my career that I was really spending a lot of time with the chiefs in the village and the men in the village. And this is because the way the, the, way, uh, the, uh, the village and the culture is structured, a lot of the decisions around natural resource management have been made historically by men and continue to do so in, in our modern day times. If we held workshops, I found I was still spending time with the men. The women were actually too busy cooking for those workshops that they actually couldn't participate. In fact, rural women in Fiji, I think, are some of the busiest people that I know, because if they're not cooking, or they're looking after their children or their homes, they're tending to their gardens, or they're out fishing on their, for food for their families. So about two years ago, we started to do a lot of work to look at seafood supply chains in Fiji, and in particular, the sea cucumber and the mud crab fisheries. And what this involves is developing these very detailed questionnaires in which you go around and you interview every, every player that's involved in the fishery from the fisher. And from, when I say the word fisher, I mean both fishermen and fisherwomen, to the processor, to the exporter, to the middleman, to the seller. And if you use these structured questionnaires, you can actually start to find out who is involved in the fishery, what they're investing, what are they doing, and also you get to really document and really draw out how all these different complicated relationships that they have with each other. As we started to do this work, looking at seafood supply chains, we started to quantify the role that men and women were playing in these fisheries. For example, with the sea cucumber fishery, we found that 35% of the fishers we interviewed were actually women. And these are women that were harvesting, actively harvesting and selling for the Asian export market. When we started looking at the mud crab fishery, we actually were even more surprised. The figure was even higher. In Fiji, at least 80% of fishers are actually women, again, actively harvesting mud crabs and selling mostly to our domestic market here in Fiji. So, given this role that women are playing that I've just described, they're very active in these fisheries, then it makes me ask a number of questions. Why, if women are so involved in fisheries, are they so poorly recognized nationally? If women are so involved in our fisheries, then why are they not afforded the same opportunities for training and capacity as fishermen? And then if women are involved in both subsistence and commercial fisheries, why are they not equally represented, or why are they so poorly represented when there's decisions that need to be made around fisheries planning and fisheries management? So I think there are many reasons, but what I'm going to do is just really share and focus on three. Firstly, I think because of the way we do our national summaries, when we do national statistics, 
we tend to only focus on commercial fisheries, the things that bring in money. So this means we tend to undervalue our subsistence fisheries. By undervaluing our subsistence fisheries, we then undervalue then the role that women are playing in these fisheries. Secondly, if we are dealing with data, we tend to just aggregate the data. We tend to aggregate them into one group and just lump them together as fishes. As a result, when most of us sort of see the word fishes, then we, we tend to just think, oh, we're just talking about the fishermen and not the, and not the fisherwomen. And then I think also because our cultural norms are so ingrained in us, I think that often when we go out into these communities, we just accept the way things are. We've known that historically this is how they've been done. If you work for an international organization like myself, you're going to be even more cautious about not interfering with cultural norms and being sensitive to how you impact on indigenous cultures. The other thing I want to point out is that, you know, when we talk about fisherwomen, they're not just, they're not just fishing. Women are also actively involved in processing as well, as you can see in these images. As we looked a lot into this sort of data and the information, we, we found other interesting things that I want to share with you. First of all, that when we were looking at what the income and what people were making, we just found this, that in general, in many instances, women were earning less than their male counterparts. Women were also involved in a wider diversity of fisheries. They were because because involved in both the subsistence and the commercial fisheries, and not just one or the other. And then also, because these women were so um, in, invested in these fisheries, they were also spending a lot of time, uh, you know, in addition to their normal work act activities as well. You also find that women, when they take their catch, a greater proportion of it will actually go towards the wanting to split it between their subsistence fisheries and their commercial, and the commercial fishing being income for the family. So men, if you look at the catch that they're catching, most of it or the majority of it is tending to more go towards bringing income for the family. And what this does is really emphasizes the really different but very complementary roles that men and women are playing in fisheries in Fiji. So what I've described so far is actually not unique to Fiji and actually plays out in communities all over the world. A 2012 study by the Wildlife Conservation Society actually documented that, yes, all over the world, men and women have these very different but complementary roles when it comes to fisheries. If you look at the fisheries sector, at about almost 50% of that sector is actually made up of women. However, when you start to delve into the data, look at the projects on the ground, you start to see a really common and disturbing pattern. And this is, there seems to be this consistent failure to engage fisherwomen in fisheries management. If, if they're involved, it often is some token small amount. And then if there are pro projects being developed, they are largely targeted at fishermen rather than the actual, fish, actual fisherwomen. And this makes the women particularly vulnerable to what is called displacement. So let me give you an example because I think it's really important to understand this concept of displacement. And I'm going to give you an example from Tanzania. In the Kilwa district in Tanzania, the women have traditionally caught octopus for sale and also for putting food on their table. When companies started to come in, the prices of octopus actually started to increase. And as a result, men started entering into this fishery. The men would, would go on their boats out onto the reef flats and collect octopus, an activity that's actually prohibited for women. They would also ignore the traditional practice that these women had of only fishing and harvesting at very particular times of the year, and this helped to protect the, the reef stock, stock of the octopus. As a result, we found that the women were very quickly displaced from this fishery, the stocks declined, profits declined, due to overfishing and the pressure that was coming in and the, of the interference from middlemen. What this example that I've given you also highlights something else that's really important I really want to share with you. That because the majority of the poor, or the rural, are poor are women, 
because their goods and services, because they're sorry, so reliant on goods and services provided by nature, they're often disproportionately impacted if you have a fisheries collapse or if there's some kind of degradation of a natural resource. So why does, anything, why does any of this actually matter? Why is it important? Well, globally, we are losing our fisheries at an alarming rate. In developed countries, at least 60% of stocks are depleted and in need of urgent rebuilding. So I'm going to repeat that. I did not say the stocks were declining, about to decline, or going to decline in some distant future. I said 60% of stocks in developed countries are depleted to the point that they need rebuilding. Paradoxically, some of the areas that are the most productive in terms of fisheries actually have the highest rates of malnutrition and poverty. What this means is that we really need a drastic rethinking globally on how we do fisheries management. And one of the areas that I would like to see real transformative change in is how we include gender in fisheries management. So when I talk about including gender in fisheries management, I'm not talking about promoting women over men or even promoting practices that are disrespectful or impactful to men or to our culture. When I'm talking about gender, I'm talking about recognizing the very different and complementary roles that men and women play in fisheries and how these roles define who has the power, who has the influence, and who ultimately is making decisions about how natural resources are used and allocated. I'm not asking us to now take all those resources and shift them and just focus on fisher women. What I'm saying is that when we're now, when we do fisheries management, if you, if you take a gender-based approach to fisheries management, you need to be inclusive. You need to understand and recognize that men and women both have important roles. You need to include both. If you address work from a gender perspective, what you're doing is, is actually just recognizing that there are these inequalities out there between the genders. And then you're slowly starting to build the possibilities towards more equitable and more participatory relationships. But as I leave here today, I don't want you to leave feeling very disparaged or down or depressed about the state of the fisheries, even though it is. There is uh, we need to be alarmed about what's happening out there. And I want to give some kind of practical examples of what I mean about in being better at including gender in fisheries management. So first of all, let's take the time. When we start doing some work on fisheries, take the time. Let's really try and understand the role that men and women are playing in different fisheries. Don't jump in and make assumptions. If we actually took the time to actually understand the different roles that men and women play and how complementary they are to each other, then we can start to understand where the inequalities lie and then we can start to put in the right fisheries management action, the right strategy to again address that imbalance. We also need to become so, so, so much better at including women in workshops and in, in decisions around fisheries management. This is probably going to differ for different parts of the world. In Fiji, we're going to have to maybe think about holding those workshops when the women are more available. We're going to have to think about it. if they're not comfortable at first voicing what they want to say in front of the men, is creating a different, a safe space for them to have their discussions and to be heard. The other thing we've got to stop doing is we've got to stop undervaluing our subsistence fisheries. It's not just about the money. If we actually took the time to actually value our subsistence fisheries the way we do our commercial fisheries, we would then stop undervaluing the role that women play because women play such a huge role in terms of food security in our local communities. The other thing we could do is build, if need be, build support networks for women. And I feel incredibly proud to be part of the Women in Fisheries Network here in Fiji. And the Women in Fisheries Network is actually bringing together conservation practitioners and NGOs, government, private sector, anybody who cares about this issue to try and provide better support to fisher women, to make their voice stronger and heard. And then lastly, please don't exclude the men. 
please continue to include them. They are still vitally important. Don't make assumptions that the men will not be supportive of their women. When we were doing our work on mud crabs, we were actually overwhelmed by the level of support and enthusiasm the men had for us working with their women, trying to address fisheries management issues on the ground. We found if you approach them in the respectful way, you'll get their full support. And then as you leave here today, I hope you leave with a greater sense of how much women like this are this amazing, untapped resource a knowledge base for us to draw on. If there's just one thing I can ask you all to do was, would be to actually go out, find these women, spend time with them in their habitats that they work in, listen and learn. Because if you do, I guarantee it is going to be the best marine biology lesson that you could ever have. Thank you. <laughs>